Good afternoon and welcome. Welcome to VIA Voices. I'm John Fanestill, Executive Director at VIA International. On behalf of the entire VIA team, we welcome you and thanks for joining us. This is uh, VIA Voices, a weekly uh, 12 noon Tuesday uh, conversation with people from within the network of VIA International. And uh, once a month, we turn our attention directly to the US-Mexico borderlands, which is our focus for today. And uh, very pleased to have as our guest, David Shirk of the University of San Diego. Leading the conversation today will be uh, Dr. Jim Gerber, retired from faculty from San Diego State University and one of our VIA International Board members. So I'm gonna turn it over and let him introduce our guest for the day. Thank you, John. Um, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I guess it is now. Uh, it's a, a real pleasure for me to be here, especially with today's guest. Um, David Shirk. David is a friend of mine. We've known each other for, I don't know how many years, uh, quite a few. Um, I remember when he was still a graduate student at uh, UCSD, uh, working with, uh, with the Center for U.S. Mexican Studies there. Uh, so David is, uh, is, is currently a professor of political science at the uh, University of San Diego, a former director of the Transborder Institute there, and is uh, the, I'm not quite sure of his title, but he's, the, uh, he's, he's in charge of the Justice in Mexico project, which is run out of USD. Uh, and it has done a lot of great work. I really uh, encourage you to check that out uh, online. If you go to the justiceinmexico.org, I believe is, uh, is the website. Um, and you can see all the great stuff they're doing. So I thought I'd begin uh, by asking David to um, to just tell us a little bit about how you got, how did you get involved, you know, working on Mexico and Mexican issues? Because I, as I recall, you grew up in actually in Pennsylvania mostly, and and uh, not exactly a hotbed of uh, Mexican studies there. <laughs> so how did yeah. how did that happen? Well, first of all, let me say thank you for the invitation to talk to you guys today. And as I explained to John and Jim and, uh, and the others, um, I, I have to apologize for the background noise. I wanted to prove to everyone that it's safe to come to Tijuana, uh, at least to the Starbucks in Tijuana. Uh, and so I came uh, down here this morning to just uh, be able to uh, broadcast live from from uh, one of the local Starbucks down here. So uh, I apologize first and foremost for the audio quality of, of uh, my conversation today. But um, uh, anyway, the, in answer to the question, I mean, I, uh, I got in, interested in Mexico and involved in Mexico because I studied Spanish in, in uh, high school. And I was forced to study Spanish by my mom and dad uh, I wanted to, I grew up in rural Pennsylvania where there were a lot of Pennsylvania Dutch and all my, all the cool kids, and I wanted to be one of the cool kids, all of them were studying German. My mom said, you're not going to study German. Nobody's going to speak German. Uh, nobody speaks German anywhere outside of Germany. They were not good conquerors. They were not good colonialists. And so <laughs> you need to learn, uh, you need to learn Spanish because that is going to be actually useful to you in, in your daily life. So when I went to college, um, unfortunately, the, the, uh, my university did not have uh, a Spanish a pro, a, a travel study abroad program. I, was, I wanted to go live in Spain, study in Spain. I got to visit during the high school trip and I was enthralled by you know, the, the old world. Um, all they had was Mexico and Costa Rica. And I was like, I don't know anything about Costa Rica. Uh, and I've at least read about the pyramids in Mexico. So I'm gonna go to Mexico. And I, I did that for two semesters and I was hooked. Um, was that, is that Mexico City? Uh, I, was in, I was in Puebla at the Universidad de las Americas in Puebla. Yeah. Um, which is beautiful, super Americanized, like private school. Um, but I, I, I went there for a semester and my Spanish got a little better. More importantly, I, I got a girlfriend. And so I was like, I'm going back for a second semester. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's the truth of it. And ultimately, um, I then studied abroad a couple of other places. But when I went to graduate school, which is where I met you, um, I decided that, um, you know, I was, I, I was really interested in um, 
continuing my studies of Mexico. I was also interested in studying like the Pacific Rim, East Asia. Um, I had studied in Japan for a semester, no girlfriend. Um, and um, I decided that the closest I could get to Mexico and Japan in the continental United States was here in San Diego. Um, and so I, I came to UCSD and, and that's where I, I started working with San Diego Dialogue. That's actually where I first met Jim, uh, working on a project on the Baja California economy. Um, and so it's, it's um, you know, ever since that time, and, and of course, as someone who studied in the real Mexico, not the border region, um, in central Mexico, I was a little reluctant to like, you know, learn about Tijuana and go to Tijuana because it was, you know, so Americanized in my view. Um, and uh, I, I received a, a really good education from people like Jim about just really how fascinating the region we live in is and how the mixing and blending and the many different, I mean, the only, the best thing about living in San Diego is that it's not Orange County. Sorry for, this is a little bit of public security situation here. Uh, in Tijuana, give me a second. <laughs> it's just an ambulance. It's just, but you know, if if San Diego didn't have Tijuana, it would just be Orange County. Yeah. Uh, but the fact that we can literally, like, thirty minutes drive down to Tijuana, get a nice Starbucks, have um, uh, you know tacos uh, at your local uh, puesto, is is really one of the reasons why I wanted to live here for. My, my whole life and uh, was able to finagle a job to, to getting uh, to be a professor at the University of San Diego and uh, the rest is history. Yeah. Well, you, you did well in picking um, UCSD for political science because I think it's one of the, I think it's ranked one of the very top political science departments in the nation. Uh, for graduate studies, it certainly got after I left. Yes, uh, yeah. after they got rid of me, that, that <laughs> yeah. that's when they. Yeah. yeah, and you're very you're very generous saying you learned anything about Tijuana from me. I think it's been the reverse, but in any case, um, the the you know one of the things that you've done that really intrigued me uh, because I think as far, I mean as far as I know, this is not my area of research, so I may be mistaken, but I I think you're the only person that I know of that, that's done. Uh, surveys of police departments in Mexico. Uh, and so you did uh, first in Guadalajara and then in uh, Ciudad Juarez, which, you know, um, 2011, I think that was. Um, that, you know, that was a, a rough time in Juarez. Um, and to survey the police department then is, is just a fascinating concept. And then in Tijuana, you surveyed the police in Tijuana. Um, so could, could, how did you, how did you get into that and, and what, you know, what were the, some of the things that stood out as you, as you did these surveys, maybe just talk a, just a, a couple of words about what the surveys were exactly, um, uh, as well. So, you know, um, the Justice in Mexico program was really the brainchild of, of Wayne Cornelius at the Center for U.S. Mexican Studies. Back in the 90s, he wanted to develop a project on judicial reform and, and really looking at how the judici judiciary and the judicial sector would be important as Mexico went through a process of democratic uh, transition and consolidation, right? You can't have democracy without the rule of law. Uh, as we learned on January 6th in the United States. Um, the, the, uh, you have to have a functioning judicial sector apparatus. And so early in the 2000s, we were able to get funding from the Hewlett Foundation to bring together some of the top experts on pu public security, um, uh, administration of justice, including you know, prosecutions and so forth, um, and really take a look at and help diagnose some of the problems of the criminal justice system in Mexico, and, um, and particularly criminal justice, right? Because one of the things that we understood as Mexico was coming out of a period of prolonged single party rule is that for a long time, police forces and public security was a function of a, essentially a semi-autocratic state. And we're, you know, when we think about policing and democratic policing in particular, um, it, it's, it, it's a police, a policing that is um, accountable, 
and that respects basic human rights and and and, and rules uh, of uh, and protocols for proper conduct. And that was clearly not um, present in Mexico, you know, 20 years ago, um, and it's still elusive today. Um, I would say police have gotten better generally in Mexico uh, over time, uh, but it's only been two decades, and uh, it's a long it's a long term process to democratize and professionalize your police. As we learned in the United States, um, you know, recently um, and over the span of the post civil rights era, um, but. You know, talking specifically about the work that we did on surveys, we, we started a project and, and I, I had seen a survey of Mexican judicial sector personnel that was um, conducted by um, one of my colleagues, Miguel Sare, who is an eminent jurist in Mexico, a law professor, civil rights champion in Mexico. Um, and he had done this survey of, of uh, prosecutors in um, in Mexico, and I thought, well, that's a neat idea. I I wonder if we could do something similar with police. And and you're right. Up until that point, I had not seen surveys of police in Mexico. And actually, there are not many um, independently administered surveys of police anywhere in the world. So we had this crazy idea of well, why don't we try to develop a survey of of the operators of the criminal justice system. Um, and we would, inter we would survey or try to survey police, try to survey um, prosecutors, uh, public defenders, judges. And it was, it was a little bit of a crazy idea, but we had um, some folks that were well positioned to help us make that happen. And, and so starting in Guadalajara, we knew the head of the citizen security uh, committee of, and who was uh, able to convince the mayor let's do this. Police chiefs did not want to do it. So you really needed the, um, the, the municipal um, leaders to say, you have to do this. And sure enough, we were able to, in our very first survey, um, back in 2009, we were able, with funding from uh, the Hewlett Foundation, from the Tinker Foundation, we were able to go in and survey, um, I believe it was 4,000 200 police officers from eight different municipalities that make up the Guadalajara metropolitan area. So Tlajomulco, Tlatelolco, uh, Zapopan, um, El Salto, Guanajuato, sorry, sorry Guadalajara. Um, I'm sure I'm gonna miss the, the last three. We were able to pull together uh, a, a research team and uh, work with a, a, an independent survey firm to figure out the policing schedules. We didn't want to take, you know, three, 400 police off the streets uh, at any given time, because that could be a public safety hazard. Um, but we figured out a way to kind of, uh, in, in shifts, get these uh, police forces uh, to, to, to take the survey. And remarkably, because we were working with their commanding officers, we were able to survey 80% of the, yeah. the entire department. Uh, I was... Seven, I was I was shocked by the response rate. You know, it was, if you it was got huge. that in a regular survey, you'd be ecstatic. The, oh, the, it's, the percentage it, of people that responded, yeah. It was basically a census of the entire police department. And then we did a similar survey, uh, as, you, as you noted, in 2010 in Ciudad. Well, it wasn't 2000. So we initiated contact in, in Juarez with the mayor in 2010. And in that case, the same person who had been public security uh, uh, citizen uh, committee chair moved up into Gobernación and was working for Gobernación in the Calderón administration. So they were able to lean on uh, the, the local authorities in um, Chihuahua and, and Juarez to, to let us do this survey. And we again surveyed the entire municipal police force of, of uh, Ciudad Juarez. And I believe there we surveyed something around 1,200. Uh, of their officers, including administrative personnel and you know top-ranked officials, and um, uh, you know it was extremely dangerous at that time, um, especially for the officers that were participating in the survey because you know we were asking them questions, very sensitive questions about corruption on the force, about infiltration, and um, you know uh, about uh, their colleagues that they'd lost. 
and we when we were going around the city you know we had to you know we had to move move in like specially uh commissioned um you know private vehicles or uh, pri private security vehicles um Actually, no, we did that for for one of our visits, and then the rest, I think we were, we just um, we just had taxis. But the, the the point is, it was a scary time, right? It was it was the height of the violence in in Juarez, and um, we learned a lot about what was going on. We we arrived the very first conversation we had with the mayor. Um, we arrived the day after the Colonia Salvador massacre, um, and so we had interviews lined up with the um, uh, I, believe it was, uh, I can't remember her last name, Patricia was the um, uh, attorney general of the state of, uh, of Chihuahua. We had uh, interviews lined up with the head of the federal police forces, interviews lined up with um, the, the, the state and local police forces and the mayor. And like we got there literally the night before the, the, the massacre occurred, we got there. And so we saw the entire uh, for that whole week that we were there, the entire massacre um, unfold, or the, the, the aftermath of that unfold. For those who don't remember, um, basically, this was, I think, in March or April of 2010, um, might have been, I think it was March, uh, a, uh, at a birthday party in a, uh, one of the eastern neighborhoods in Ciudad Juarez, um, a, a, a couple of uh, SUVs rolled in and walked in looking for somebody that they thought was affiliated with one of the rival gangs that was working for one of the cartels. And they just, um, they mowed down, uh, they separated the boys from the girls and they proceeded to assassinate them. And um, one of the little girls ran into the line of fire to uh, try to stop them from killing her brother. And she was killed as well. When they left, they killed uh, the father from who was running from across the street into the house where the party was taking place uh, and one other parent um, and a total i believe of 15 people were killed in that massacre it was one of the worst moments in the in the violence to that point to 2010 many worse things have happened since then but after that um the governor so while we were there, I saw the governor come to the house of the family, one of the families that had been killed. The, um, I believe it was the, uh, I think it was the Durazo family or the, the, the Duarte family, but came to their house. And when he came to their house, um, they refused to see him. They turned their back on him and said, you turned your back on our family. Um, anyway, lots of interesting stories like this uh, um, from doing these surveys. Um, but the, the bottom line is we ultimately wound up coming to Tijuana in 2000, um, 2014 to do the same survey. Um, we again surveyed about 80% of the police department. We had some local contacts here um, and um, got you know, tremendous results at a time when Tijuana was becoming um, the most violent city in Tijuana, as, or, sorry, in, in, in Mexico, as the violence was dying down elsewhere. Sorry, that was a huge, long. Uh, no, that's explanation. good. That's 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 good. That's good. So, what? Tell me briefly, like, like. So, what are? Uh, as I looked at the surveys, they they look pretty similar across the cities in terms of the of the types of responses you got, the proportion of people that that answered one way versus another way. It was there was a there was a high maybe it's the way the survey was structured. I'm not sure, but that but there was a high degree of similarity. I didn't see a radical difference between Guadalajara and Juarez and Tijuana in the responses of the police. Um, so what were what were some of the things that stood out to you then in terms of the of of the way uh, people answered questions? What questions in particular did you find most interesting? So first of all, I think it's really important to understand the people that we're talking about, right? Um, the profile. So our, our survey tried to look at three different things. Who are the police? Like, who are they? What's their education level? What's their gender? Um, you know, what's their economic, socioeconomic status? Um, two, what is it like on the job? And three, what do they think? about all kinds of things uh, in terms of um, the public security situation, the politics of all this, and 
you know, what is what is their view ultimately of uh, the work that they're that they're doing and, and their relationship to the rest of society. And you're right across the board. There's a lot of similarities, and it tells us something about Mexican police institutions um, and just generally law enforcement and the rule of law in Mexico. And the first thing you learn looking at the profile is it is an it is not a professional endeavor. Right? Policing in Mexico is not a professional endeavor. You are not treated as a professional. You are not compensated as a professional. And so the quality of uh, personnel in Mexican police institutions, generally speaking, is not very high. Um, we had in our survey average levels of education that were basically middle school education, right? I mean, here in the United States, most police officers have a college degree. Um, and look, you don't need to have a college degree to be a, a competent professional person. Um, but um, the, the level of education um, does speak to, um, first of all, um, you know, pay, right? What, they're, what these folks are able to uh, bring down in a competitive economy and where they're able to get jobs. Uh, and, and the fact that we are able to recruit highly educated, highly trained individuals who've invested tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars in their education, you know, tells you something about the, the, the investment that's been made in the, the people who work in U.S. policing. Um, we also learned about the vetting process for police and, and the level of training that they had. Some of this we learned from the survey, some of it from the focus groups that we did alongside the survey. Um, but, you know, if you ask them, wh what amount of training have you had prior to, you know, hitting the streets, uh, you know, prior to, be in, to, to actually being a commissioned officer? Generally speaking, no more than four months. Um, compared to in the United States, where we have uh, several months of police academy training, um, we then have, you know, sort of this, this rookie uh, uh, apprenticeship uh, process and so on. We ask them questions like, how many times have you fired your weapon or did you fire your weapon prior to, um, hang on a sec. How many times have you, have you fired your weapon prior to you know, put donning the uniform. And generally it was like less than 60 times. It was like often very specific number, like 54. We're like, why 54? Because that's how many bullets are in a single box of uh, bullets that they would give us for the training. You ask that question of a US law enforcement officer, they have fired their, their firearm hundreds of times to gain proficiency with lethal force. Um, and of course they've received ample training it's 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 so nice to have authenticity. Uh, it, it you know you ask them uh, how many it, it, they've learned how to use they've been trained in non lethal force. Um, now they get some of that training, for example, here at the um, Tijuana um, uh, Police Academy. We we went there and and like they get trained in like hand to hand combat, like wrestling and things like. We got to actually see some of the drills. That was cool, um, but. You know, I, I just want to underscore the limited amount of training. Um, but there's surprisingly, that's where a lot of the emphasis has actually been placed is um, making sure that vetting and training, that's where the most of the investment has been. When you look at the surveys, to me, one of the most telling questions in all three cities was we asked the question, are the procedures for um, advancement on the force clear? that question. Um, we also asked the question, are the pr procedures for advancement on the force fair, right? So is it, are there clear and fair merit-based essentially uh, criteria for advancement on the force? The answer was no. I mean, of all the questions that we asked, that was the strongest point of agreement among officers. And so what does that leave? The next question we asked was, you know, but uh, I can't remember exactly how we asked it, but we asked the question of, you know, what is it that determines your ability to advance on the force? It's your relationship to your superiors, right? It's politics. 
And so what we're talking about in, you know, for sociologists and political scientists is, um, you know, th there is no Weberian bureaucratic merit-based system in Mexican law enforcement. And in the absence of that, you have a paternalistic sort of um, uh, client-based, cl patron-client-based system of networks where it's who you know and how you get along in the organization. And what that means is that if there's corruption potentially at the top, um, you're going to follow whatever um, that um, that corrupt network or patronage network uh, tells you to do if you want to advance on the force. Um, and so that that was, you know, the most, I mean, we all knew that we knew that. But here you had, you had Mexican police officers saying in large numbers, A, there is corruption on the force. B, that corruption is at the highest levels in the department. Uh, C, um, you don't get anywhere on this department if uh, in this department, if you don't play the game. Uh, and D, you know, there's no civil service protections. Like if we had, we had officers tell us, um, you know, in surprising numbers that um, the highest level that they advanced to on the force was not the level that they were at now. So there's this sort of, you know, you make your way up and then you, you run out of favor or a new uh, police chief comes in every three years and now you're down here, right? And so it's these contending, what they call in Mexico camarillas or factions within the department that are gaining power. And there's no, you know, you don't, the good officers are not being promoted and staying at the top and instituting good procedures. It's just every three years there's a shakeup and uh, it's, it's luck of the draw who's, who's on top at any given moment. Just a clarification, David, the, the, um, the police chiefs are appointed by the mayor and, and, and then they choose their staff who will be there, you know, the, the second in command, et cetera. Is that? Yeah. Like so, so yeah, the structure of municipal, uh, uh, Mexico has a federal system, which is, a, a, you know, the president, Congress, there's the state governor and uh, its Congress. And then there are municipalities, which are, some people say they're like our counties, but they're not like our counties because they actually have a single head of government and the city council. And then on the city council, there is a, um, a public security, um, uh, not on the city council, but in, in the mayor's cabinet, there's a public uh, security chief. And then there's a police chief that reports to the public security chief. But basically directly or indirectly, um, elected officials, when they come in uh, for their three year, up until recently, non-renewable, non-reelectable term, they would come in and they would appoint a new police chief, a new public security secretary, who would appoint a new police chief, who would bring all his buddies and cousins onto the police, uh, the, the upper ranks of the police department. Everybody else would scatter to the wind or get demoted, um, and and so you had, uh, you know, the other problem, the other problem of policing in Mexico, uh, besides the unprofessionalism, is the lack of continuity. In, in some ways, you'd rather have unpro unprofessional police that continue to be there over a long period of time, so that at least whatever order they can establish gets to, you know, yeah. uh, whatever equilibrium they find is a continuous equilibrium. Yeah. Um, and and that, that doesn't happen because of the structure of Mexican government. Now in 20, 2018, for the first time in Mexico, um, the, the option of re-election of local officials was introduced. And in the upcoming elections that we have in 2021, uh, ju ju July of this year, it'll be the first time that a sitting, a newly elected um, mayor can be re-elected to the same position. That's really fascinating. Um, and it's maybe part of the reason why we've seen a, a lot of attention to these elections and especially some violence surrounding these elections because there's a lot at stake. Yeah, yeah. I, I, you know, one of the things that struck me about the surveys also was that uh, you asked a question about uh, corruption within the police departments. And, and um, you know, I don't know how honest people are on surveys in general. And certainly that question is going to have some challenges to elicit what people really think. But, but it was bimodal. 
you know, there was like, there was like a big group that says, you know, there's a lot of corruption. Then there was a pretty good sized group that says, no, it's, it's good. Things are good. And I just, I didn't know what to think about that. You know, if it's, if it's just some people are covering for the corruption or if maybe in the experience of some individual police officers, it's, it is a pretty clean organization. I, I don't know. Is that naive of me to think that? I think it's a little bit of everything, right? I mean, I yeah. think on the one hand, if you've got four, like, number one, we have no basis for comparison here. Yeah, I don't have a, a survey of the Department of uh, Public Safety, Public Security uh, Department of Chula Vista or San Diego, where I can look at, you know, this, the, the survey and say, oh, you know, five, only 5% of US police say that um, there's corruption on the force. Uh, and I'd love to have that, by the way, if anyone wants to help me do a police survey in Chula Vista or, do, or uh, San Diego, I'd love to know like what percent of, because I can tell you, if you asked professors at the University of San Diego, what percent of you believe that there's corruption at the university, you come up with some number, right? Some number of professors be like, oh, let me tell you some stories, right? <laughs> but, um, I don't know, honestly, what's the right percentage of your organization that would be so disgruntled that they would answer in a survey read by a bunch of gringos that um, the, 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 the department is corrupt. But the fact that in general, across the board in the three cities that we studied, the number was like 38 or 40%, that jumped out at me, right? Like that, that's, that's a non-trivial, whatever they're thinking is, it's a non-trivial percentage. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that then, as you say, that on this other side, there's another 40% that are like, no, we good. It's all right. We're, no, no problems here. <laughs> like that, that also kind of stretches credulity, uh, yeah, you know, yeah. given what the other 40% are saying. So uh, my sense is that, yes, there's probably, if you are corrupt, your answer to that, it's like the, the, the old uh, question, like if you go to a crossroads and and uh you know that there's two brothers and um uh, that one of which will always lie to you and one of which will always tell the truth what question do you ask them to figure out the right road uh on your journey yeah. um there is one question that you can ask and I, I can't even remember it off the top of my head <laughs> but like how do you, how do you know which um you know you know that at least some some of those folks are telling the truth um, David, and, David, I do, I remember the, uh, the, 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 the hypothetical, you're, the question you'd ask is, if I were here, if I had been here I yesterday, the other guy. if I oh. had been here yesterday, which road would you have told me to take, right? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Okay, that's the answer. Very good. I, the I thought it was, if I asked, I thought it was also another answer is, you can say, if I asked him which road to take, what would he tell me? Something like that. Yeah, but anyway. Uh, so yeah, there's this huge social scientific dilemma of what do you do with this question of corruption and how do you measure it? And But, but to me, I, I, re, I think the real test will be if, as I hope we can do someday, like in 24, 2024 maybe, if we can do the same survey again in Tijuana, I wanna know what the answer would be for the police force. I'm hoping it would be 35% or 30%, uh, some you know, uh, sig statistically significant difference in the percentage. Um, or, or, I mean, honestly, when I'm, when I'm 70 or 80 years old, if I can get someone to do that same survey in Tijuana, I would really like to see a different number. That's, the, that's, that's what I'd like to see. Yeah. So, um, but it's, it's, it's a fascinating thing because, um, Again, when we ask them that question, we ask them, is it at, the, is it at high levels? It is at, at low levels. Of the 40% who said there was corruption, it was some crazy number, like 80 or 90% of them said, it's either at the very top or it's at all levels, right? And so if that's your answer, um, I, I think that's a, that, you know, it's really indicative of, of a problem. Uh, for a junior officer who comes on board, a starry-eyed um, Serpico, right? There's no, there's never so far uh, in my time, 20 years or so of studying Mexican uh, security issues, I've not seen the officer who stands up, junior officer who stands up and says, "Hey, there's corruption here. 
the, the media need to know about this and do something about it. And the reason that that has not happened is because that person is dead. <laughs> if you are, are going to try to buck the system or buck, uh, you know, call out corruption, you're going to die. Um, and, and, and if you think, so I like to think about this from the perspective of someone in the United States. We think we have, and, and until recently, you know, I would say we didn't really pay a lot of attention to policing in the U.S. And we tended to have this position that, oh, you know, we've got these super professional, very um, uh, high, high integrity police forces. Well, if you're, if you're a person of color, you know that's not true. Um, and you know that maybe it's better today than it was in 1950, um, but it's not that much better, um, depending on what your address is or what you look like. And so um, I really look back at the history of policing in the United States and think about the things that helped us to transform policing and, and move away from uh, the very corrupt, I mean, there was huge corruption, obviously, in the 1920s and 1930s during the um, era of, um, of prohibition, right? I mean, the same kind of corruption, organized crime, uh, et cetera. Um, but, you know, as we move forward into the 1940s and 50s, um, some of that went away. Um, but it wasn't really until the 1950s that we started to see police held to a higher standard. And one of the first higher standards that was introduced was the civil rights era, right? The idea that you're gonna have to treat black people like people, uh, like citizens. And you know, so over the course of the 1950s, we start to see, I think, um, you know, p police brutality being called out a little bit more. But it's really not until 1963 that we have, um, you know, the introduction of um, new decisions at the Supreme Court level that pr begin to professionalize police. For example, uh, I guess it was 1967 that we had Gideon versus Wainwright. Or no, no, sorry, uh, 1963 is Gideon versus Wainwright. And that's the case that says that every individual, every U.S. citizen, is entitled to a uh, who is if they're charged with a crime they're entitled to a public defender. Prior to 1963, that varied considerably by state, and so you could you could be brought before the authorities and have no legal defense. And having a public defender means that police actually have to come up with some kind of story about uh, and and some kind of evidence as to why you know they they hauled you in. Um, and then it was, I guess, 1967 that we had the Miranda case that said, and that's kind of been chipped away at a little bit by the Supreme Court recently, but we had the Miranda case where they said, you know what, when you arrest somebody, you have to explain to them what their rights are, um, you, you know, that they don't have to you give you any information right now. If they have the right to remain silent, if they have the right to this attorney that we established back in 63, et cetera. So, you know, think about that, 1960s. Um, that's not that long. I mean, for me, that's not that long ago. Um, and to think that it wasn't until 1971, 1972, I think it was 71, 72, that Serpico got shot for calling out his superior officers. Um, you know, it, it, and then we had the Knapp Commission and a bunch of different commissions to try to professionalize policing in the United States. And then we saw the Rampart scandal in the 1980s. We had Rodney King in the early 90s, right? We're not as, our history of policing is not as professional as we might think. And so when we cast an eye on Mexico's policing, I think we gotta look at it with a little bit of perspective and think about what they're, what they're doing here. They're moving from an authoritarian regime or semi-authoritarian system where one party controlled everything to a multi-party democratic system where, you know, we're trying to build a police apparatus at the same time that there's a massive drug war going on. So we're building the car as we're trying to drive it. And, you know, we're just barely in introducing some of the kinds of legal reforms and um, standards that we established in the United States back in the 1960s. So it's gonna be- yeah, You know, this, there's so many topics here that we could talk about. Sorry, um, sorry. 
going no, on. No, and, and it's it's super fascinating. I just I, there's a couple of things I just wanted to get to quickly before we open it up. You know, one one is um, you had mentioned earlier. You said that that um, that you think it's gotten better a little bit, um, and and we know that, that that you know AMLO has now created this uh, national police force. Uh, which I assume is present in Tijuana, although I don't know that for a fact. Uh, but is is it, in your opinion, it are there reforms taking place that are making improvements? This is not going to change overnight, but at the margin, things getting a little bit better. And does this new national police force play into that in any way? Is that part of 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 how things are getting better? So, um, you know, one of the other characteristics of public security and, and policing in, in Mexico over the last like 30 or 40 years has been every new government basically since the De La Madrid administration has faced a serious crisis of uh, policing in which they said, oh, uh, you know, the, the old policing uh, agency that we had is no good. It's cor there's corruption. You know, think back to um, uh, the um, Camarena case in the mid '80s, after Cam uh, Enrique Camarena was killed um, at the hands of the Federal uh, Public Security Directorate in Mexico. Um, that agency was disbanded, and a new agency was created because of this evidence of corruption. Well, ever since then, every new government that's come in has basically been reinventing policing. They've come up with a new agency, they give them a new logo and a new uniform. And, um, you know, it's basically been a series of uh, reforms in which we pour old wine, same, you know, people, in many cases, same procedures and training and all the other things that I've already pointed out into a new bottle with a fancy new label, and then, uh, you know, we try to drink that wine and it it's, tastes just as bad. So uh, I, I think, you know, I'm not encouraged by the creation of a new National Guard that's basically taken a bunch of former military people and a bunch of former federal police and poured them into this new agency with really no real difference in the, the standards of vetting or promotion, et cetera. Those, those changes that I think are really necessary Instit institutionalizing merit-based advancement on the force that hasn't happened. But what has happened, and you allude to in your, in your question, is you know the kinds of reforms that we saw in the United States in the 1960s to introduce due process started in the uh, mid to late 2000s. In 2008. Uh, well, it, it, in the mid 2000s, some of the state governments started to introduce new reforms that said, you know what, um, everybody has a right to a public defender. We're going to have a new uh, process in which the public defender then gets to interrogate the evidence presented by the police in, a, in what we might call an adversarial court proceeding, similar to what we have in the United States. And, um, uh, you know, they can challenge the evidence. They can and they can say, hey, you beat my you beat my client with you know, a, a two by four. Um, whatever confession he might've made is now invalidated. Um, and, and what that forces the police to do now, or what it forces prosecutors to do since the mid 2000s and since the, a similar reform was passed in 2008 at the federal level, is it forces them to come up with actual evidence uh, of wrongdoing and do real police work to gather and, and properly protect that evidence so that their case will not be challenged uh, successfully by the defense. So introducing um, a, 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 what we might say real checks and balances into criminal procedure in Mexico is for me this, the one hope uh, or one, you know, one advance, one uh, illustration of progress that um, is, is something that we didn't have 20 years ago and that hopefully will make a difference. I, the, the, the concern, of course, is if you introduce those mechanisms of accountability and the, and the result is that the defense challenges the, the prosecutor's evidence and the police's conduct and the case falls apart and that, that actor goes free, if, it, if, if that person is a, a, 
actually a, a liability, a violent individual, they're going to go out and, and potentially um, uh, recidivate, continue to uh, engage in uh, criminal behavior. And so now we have a problem of crime. And if we don't strengthen the police apparatus and the prosecutorial apparatus, um, we're just going to have lots of crime. And that's, that's, that's the challenge. That's the dilemma Mexico has right now. It's professional, professionalizing police and prosecutors. Yeah. David, uh, several of the questions in the chat room, I just want to jump in quick, are related to trying to get right down to the Tijuana border region from several people in the room who live in, in Tijuana or Rosarito, uh, Larry Herzog, who you know, familiar, an expert in the borderlands. But before we jump down to the local one question was about the results of your survey of these police officers and these police forces. Were those shared with high, higher level uh, or higher ranking officials in Mexico, elected officials and others? And, and was there any uh, uptake or what was the response of, of, uh, of uh, folks uh, with some authority in the political system to the results of your survey? That question from our friend Tom Melchior. Yeah, thanks great for great questions. And it's nice to see uh, some familiar faces uh, in, the, um, in, in the questions. Uh, uh, it's great to see uh, Elisa, uh, Larry Herzog and, and others uh, uh, following along. Uh, so number one, yes, uh, we, did, we couldn't have done these surveys without public authority uh, involvement. And um, you know, the, the mayors were genuinely interested in getting this data. I mean, if you, if you become the CEO of a new company and someone comes along and tells you, I'm gonna survey your entire uh, organization and give you independently verified information about what people think about what's working and what's not working, et cetera. Uh, and I'll do that for free with, with funding. It's not from the US government, so I'm not working for the CIA. Uh, and it's, it's actually from uh, you know, an uh, independent private foundation. Uh, and you can use this information to help you make policy decisions. Um, you know, sure, I'll take, I'll take as much information as I can get. And so they were all eager to get this information. Um, and in some cases, like I know specifically in Tijuana, the, the mayor actually used the information, acted on it. Um, this was Mayor Asticiaran, who was a medical doctor, um, you know, didn't have a lot of experience in public security. And he was like, you're gonna give me a bunch of data on my police force? I love it, thank you. And his police chiefs were not that interested. I had previously asked the police chiefs if they, were, if they, if they would help me you know, advance the idea of the survey and they, they were non-responsive. So when we went to the mayor and he was like, we gotta do this guys, uh, they jumped in on board. And, and you know, one of the concrete things that, that the Astiran administration did in response to the survey, um, we, we found in the survey, for example, um, that, uh, and let me say just, am I able to share a screen? Because I'd love to show just a couple of, uh, I want to show some pictures if I can. Um, actually, just one picture. Like this was, to me, uh, one of the clear, one of the clear indicators. We're, we're not seeing it yet. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Yep. Yep. At the station, this is what you find, right? Um, you find a uh, lack of resources that goes down to the most basic, you know, materials, right? You find uh, police that um, you know, six out of 10 are, have, have to buy their own uniform uh, or some element of their own uniform. Um, uh, six out of 10 feel the criteria for promotions are unclear or unfair, et cetera. Uh, to eight and 10 uh, report some level of corruption with seven out of 10 reporting high levels of corruption. Um, and so we see these, um, you know, across the board, these patterns in um, uh, Mexican policing where uh, there's a huge problem of resources and investment. Um, and when you look at what they're being paid, you know, you, Tijuana's police forces are among the best paid in the country. Um, and their average salaries range from 800 to thousand dollars a month. This was this, these are the older data, five six years old. So um, I guess seven years old now. Um, but dude, even you know seven years ago, a thousand dollar a month salary is not going to cut it in Tijuana if you're the breadwinner. And um, you know today, you know maybe those salaries are up to twelve or fifteen. 
hundred dollars a month. But you know, the price, the cost of living, and Jim, you would know this better than I do as an economist. I, I would say that the, co the cost of living. So sorry. So that person is making maybe twenty three to twenty five thousand dollars a year if, at best. Um, and uh, the average Chula Vista Police Department uh, officer starting salary as a rookie is like sixty, sixty-five thousand dollars a year. But the cost of living from Chula Vista to Tijuana, I don't think the difference is, you know, the cost. Maybe it is, Jim. Maybe I'm wrong. No, no, you're right. You're right. There's a difference in living standards. There's, there's just no getting around that the, the yeah. living standards are lower you know the 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 goods and services available to a police officer in in tijuana is way below what it is yeah i will say though that 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 wage differential is not as high as i've heard in many other uh, sectors or areas of the yeah. economy so that yeah. i'm interested in your observation what... that the interested in your observation that the tijuana police are among the best paid in the country and that gets a little bit to these more Questions about the borderlands. What what what's specific about the police culture here in the borderlands? I'm guessing maybe some of this has to do with Jim's prior question about well, and we experience this here in San Diego as well as well, where you have these different levels of policing, right? You have federal, uh, state, county, local, uh, you know, um, jurisdictions, if you will, and therefore you have this kind of web of law enforcement agencies. Is that true on the Mexican side as well? That you have different in law enforcement actors in the space and or what else makes uh what else makes the borderlands culture different you've talked a lot about the similarities you saw across the surveys what's what's distinctive about tijuana baja california policing so that's a great question and, and real quick i'll i'll share this uh just to give an, uh, a sense of what i'm talking about so um in uh at the federal level um you have you have Roughly 30, it's actually probably with, this is an old slide, uh, but with the, um, the newly created national police force under the, um, under uh, Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, the, the Guardia Nacional, uh, I believe the number there is like 45 or 50,000 um, federal uh, members of the National Guard. Then you've got a federal attorney general's office that has around 4,000 uh, let's just say armed agents. Um, then you've got the 31 state uh, police agencies in Mexico plus Mexico City, which collectively have around, you know, uh, 150, 160,000 uh, either investigative ministerial police or what we call preventive police. These are the guys that just drive around like in the back of, you know, a, a truck, uh, stopping crime by just looking at it, right? I mean, they're just like glorified security guards. Um, they can't actually, in, they don't help in any way to investigate crimes. They're just there to be on the scene if something happens. And then you've got um, around 1,800 uh, municipal police forces. There are 2,400 uh, municipalities in Mexico. Of those, you know, uh, uh, around 1,800 have their own municipal police forces. Um, with around 130,000 um, uh, agents working in those um, in those departments, and, and so for a city like Tijuana, with um, with roughly uh, 1,200, 1,400 municipal police, um, they're uh, they're working alongside several hundred state police officers, several hundred um, uh, Guardia Nacional in the state of Baja, California. And sometimes they don't, they're not working on the same playbook. And so we've had shootouts between state level uh, police forces, uh, particularly during the, the Hank Rohn era when Hank, uh, Jorge Hank Rohn, who's now a candidate for governor. He's a very colorful character. You've read about him in the UT. He has his own private zoo. That's all I need to say. Uh, if you have your own zoo, uh, I'm going to make judgments about uh, about you. Um, but uh, he's, you know, when Jorge Hank Ron was a governor, a mayor of Tijuana, you had direct clashes between the municipal police forces of Tijuana and the state police forces uh, of the opposing party uh, governor. And so. Um, Yes, there are these multi-layered uh, levels of law enforcement, and they 
just like in the United States, just like in Boston during the Whitey Bulger era, they're not all necessarily working on the same team. Maybe maybe infiltrated by different groups and that creates you know nor are they necessarily on the same schedule right so there's the shifting cast of characters that you've described and these overlapping jurisdictions so uh well david this has been so great and i do want to uh give jim a final uh question or a comment a closing comment before that i just want to say thank you though and uh uh for joining us uh, what i'm going to do is invite everybody in our zoom room just to give a round of applause to david for joining us thanks so much and uh, before I give uh, Jim the final word, I just want to give a shout out to folks uh, who may want to join us next week. I think what I'll do next week, uh, some of you have been uh, kind to follow uh, the latest uh, efforts of a group of ours to um, ensure that Friendship Park is open. And I've realized that there are still a lot of people who don't really quite understand how Friendship Park works or doesn't work, as the case may be. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, next week I'll host the conversation around uh, what is Friendship Park and how the heck does it work will kind of be my uh, theme for next week. I hope you'll join me. Um, but Jim, uh, will you uh, close out our conversation with anything, a uh, final question or comments uh, that you'd yeah. like to share with David? Yeah, I have a, I have a final question um, that, um, you know, I, a few years ago, I, I was thinking about driving to Guadalajara. And I remember I asked you, David, I said, so um, would that be safe? I have to go through Sinaloa. And, you know, it's, uh, you know, you read all this stuff in the news. And and you're, I'll never forget your answer to me. You said, well, to date, as far as you knew, there were absolutely zero American academics killed by narcos <laughs> driving in Mexico. So probably okay. You know, but it illustrates to me, you know, I mean, I feel like I know something about Mexico, but we get swept up in all the news about it, you know? And, and somehow we don't get swept up by all the news about gun violence in the U.S. You know, we still, we just sort of, are kind of, I don't know if we're numb or we just think, well, you know, those are, that just happens. It's not a big deal. I don't need, you know, unless it affects me directly, I'm not going to change my behavior because of some uh, gun violence that happens in a U.S. city. Um, why the difference? I mean, why do we, why do we look at Mexico in, in such a different way from how we think about our own situation when, even when there are these parallels that are similar? You have any thoughts on that? So well, this is not political science, right. but no, you're right that it's partly just media uh, attention, and I think it's you know people. You, this is a, to me an economics question, right? People tend to be really bad at probability theory, um, and really bad at thinking through the the the, the probability of uh, let's just say really good things happening to them, like winning the lottery. And the probability of really bad things happening to them, like getting shot by a narco trafficker, right? Um, and part of it is the the you know, and, and maybe it's also a psychology question, right? Like the bigger the potential result, um, or you know, whether it's a reward or a punishment, the more your brain miscalculates uh, the probability that it's going to affect you. This is why people are afraid to get on airplanes, right? Um, the, the the probability of being killed in an airplane is so much smaller than the probability of being killed in your car. Um, but the the magnitude of a car crash compared to the magnitude of a um, a plane crash is very different in the public's imagination and, and in your perception. Same with shark attacks, right? I mean. I, I am terrified. I went, my dad took me to see Jaws when I was six or seven, right? It came out in like 76 or 70, uh, 77. And we were in the theater watching it. And I'm scarred for life, right? I, I am terrified that if I go out above my waist, I, I is a 50% chance that I'm going to be attacked by a vicious great white shark. Um, and the odds are really, really, really small. Um, but you know that's you you see you, you know you see shark week and it 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 makes you think like I'm, I'm not going i'm not going into the water or i'm not going to mexico because i watch narcos and it's just um unfortunate because it is a problem of of really not understanding the frequency distributions and the ultimate you know probabilities and, and who's i mean it's it's not certainly not fair to say that that this is only uh, bad guys killing bad guys. There are a lot of innocent victims, but it is also, um, there are patterns 
to the violence that um, we can navigate uh, fairly successfully. You, you can sit at a Starbucks for a full hour and only get shot at how many times? Uh, you know, as I, yeah, I had to, I had to, I had to mute it a couple of times, but you know, generally speaking, I wasn't getting shot. So, that, that, you know, and it, David, as as you also illustrated uh, several times an hour, you know, it is a less uh, formalized and and therefore predictable and routinized law enforcement system. So I do think a lot of gringos and tourists and 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 people who travel frequently have you know un, unpleasant encounters with police, which then leads them to to imagine much more uh, you know worse outcomes, that's right? That's uh, right. You know, Getting shaken down, getting shaken down for a twenty on the you know the highway is not a, a a threat to your you know physical well-being, but it undermines your confidence in the in the system, so to yeah. speak. Or petty theft. I mean, you, yeah. the, the reality is you're in a country where there are you know a lot of people who are desperate, um, in, including police, right? So um, in in those circumstances, yeah, it's, there are you're you're vulnerable in other ways. Um, so. Well, you've, you've really given us a lot to think about, David, especially with this, this long-term uh, quest to formalize and, and uh, rationalize and professionalize and create accountable systems, right? All these struggles of uh, div nations that are in different stages of, uh, you know, uh, development or whatever we would choose to call it. So just really appreciate your taking the time to be with us today, David, and for us to get to scratch the surface of, of, of all you know about uh, policing in Mexico. We really appreciate that uh, opportunity to be in dialogue with you. And we'll hope to do it again sometime. So such a pleasure. Thank you so much. for the Thank you so much, yeah. David. And thank, thank you. you, Jim. Thanks for Jim for leading. Thanks everybody for joining. Uh, Thanks, we'll everybody. see you. We'll see yeah. you next week, uh, Tuesday, 12 noon here at Via Voices. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.